I went to a particular place, a county up um, in the north central part of Missouri, and I found information about a particular mapping unit. A mapping unit is just an area that has been um, demarcated on the map with a, those very, you know, that's, that set of lines up there is mapping out the different mapping units in, in Missouri. There are actually over 5,000 different types of soil that have been mapped in Missouri. And each of them on a soil survey map would be demarcated by a line. Believe it or not, a similar tool has been developed for the entire United States called Web Soil Survey, and you can get soil survey information for almost every location in the U.S. using this tool called Web Soil Survey. If you're in Missouri, I would say you probably might as well use the Missouri tool, but if you happen to you know, meet someone from outside of the state or be traveling and you want to see about soils that are outside of Missouri, you could also find this information for the entire United States. Okay. If you want to learn about how soils fit together in landscapes, this, this is something that, remember I, remember I was saying that a soil mapper learns how to read the landscape. They learn how, how different soils fit together kind of into a community of soils. There's a brand new map that has just been released by the University of Missouri called the General Soils Map, and it shows across the state how the different types of soil communities are lo how they fit together, how they are located. So this this is probably not something that a gardener would be interested in for their own gardener for their own garden. But if you are, if this has piqued your curiosity and you're interested in how soils fit together, this is a useful resource. It's called the General Soils Map. Okay. If you want to talk to somebody who is a specialist, who can give you information, help you interpret information from a soil survey map, in Missouri there actually is a, there's an association of professional soil scientists, and there are many, many of them. Um, I did not go through the whole list, but it looked, it looked to me when I was looking at this last night like there were well over 100. And you can click on this particular map and find all of the professional soil scientists in your county that can provide information to you. Now, this particular map is actually on the, um, I think, Health and Human Services website because the number one job for professional soil scientists today, what do you think it is? It's to identify where septic tanks can be um, expected to, to function properly. That, that's a very important job that soil scientists perform. Um, if, you just, if you just cite a septic tank without getting the advice from a soil scientist, you are more likely than not to have a septic tank that does not work properly. You need to have proper soil, uh, the appropriate soil properties. So particularly if you are thinking about building a house, citing a septic tank, you need the advice of a professional soil scientist. But these guys, can also give you lots of other information about how to use soil in Missouri. Okay, so let's think about now what you can do personally. You're, you're probably not a professional soil scientist. You probably just have some experience through your interaction in the garden with soil. One of the things that I encourage people to think about is what are the inherent properties of their soil? What are the properties that they probably will not change? What are the properties that basically are just a property of the soil, the way that soil formed? What do you think I'm actually showing on this slide? This is something kind of interesting that I actually developed for my students. I took that clod of soil that's in the middle and I actually fully dispersed it. So I took it apart into its pieces. So when you look at those four quadrants up there, you're not looking at different soils, you're looking at fractions of the same soil. I've taken the soil apart into its different particle sizes. So here's a riddle for you, and I ask my students this. If you took a soil apart like this, so that you found out how much sand, silt, and clay was in it, could you put that soil back together? 
I actually, I should have brought them with me, but I actually have glass jars that contain the fractions of this soil. And I could just mix them all into one jar. Would I now have the soil again? Well, why not? Absolutely. The way those pieces fit together is what gives the soil its function. And so it's kind of like if we blew up this building into thousands of pieces, we, we still would have all the pieces, but we wouldn't have any rooms or windows or, you know, any functionality of this building anymore. And so soil is a structure. Soil has structure. And if you take apart the pieces, you don't know about how it all works because you don't know how it fit together. <coughs> okay, so the pieces. This is somewhat arbitrary, but the pieces that we normally talk about when we think about the parts of soil are sand, silt, and clay. You guys probably have heard of sand, silt, and clay before. The biggest particle, of course, is sand. Intermediate particle is silt, and the smallest particles are clay. And even though I've just told you that the structure is what matters, the composition of sand, silt, and clay also has a big effect on how your soil will function. So just the actual quantities of sand, silt, and clay are very important in terms of how your soil behaves. And for the most part, when you manage a soil, you are not changing this composition. You do have an effect on the structure of the soil, but unless you have new soil being brought in, of course, you could buy some new soil and bring it in, or unless you have severe erosion and you've lost some of your soil, your topsoil, you're not likely to actually change the texture of your soil. The way that scientists talk about the distribution of these particles, the sand, silt, and clay, is using this diagram called the textural triangle. And so there are actually 12 different categories, 12 different textural classes, and it's, a, it's just a way of giving a name to the different possible arrangements of sand, silt, and clay. So any particular soil would fit somewhere on this diagram. What, what do you think is the dominant textural class in the Midwest? Well, see, I'm not from northern Missouri. It's, po it's quite possible that in northern Missouri that your soils are much clayier than the overall average for the Midwest. What were you going to say? Silt. silt loam, right. The, the dominant soils in the Midwest are silt loam. We have lots of silt because of our history of glaciation. There's a material called luss. L-O-E-S-S. -S. Anybody ever heard of Luss? L Luss is the glacial flour that was left behind the finest materials that were ground up by the glaciers. When the glaciers retracted, this material was primarily left in the river valleys. And then during the winter time, when things were mostly dry and frozen, this material was picked up and it was redistributed across the Midwest. And so we have these layers of Luss right near the river, like where, where I did my undergraduate education, Principia College, which is right on the bluffs of the Mississippi, we have 30 to 40 feet of luss. But as you move out farther and farther away from the river valleys, the luss cap gets thinner and thinner, and so your soil resources change as that luss gets thinner and thinner. But the soils of the Midwest, in general, are very blessed by having this luss, because this is very fertile, mineral-rich material, and it's actually quite young relative to most soils in the world. You know, most soils in the world are millions of years old. Yes? Okay. Yeah. So, one thing that's interesting about this lust that you, just a kind of an aside that you can observe, it stands up vertically very well. So, you can see a road cut where you have ne nearly a vertical wall of soil. And that, that's, that happens because of the unique properties of lust. You have all of these, at the microscopic level, you have all these jagged edges where it fits together kind of like puzzle pieces. And so it will stand up very vertically. And so in most parts of the world, soil will not do that. But places where you have lust, you can have very vertical road cuts. Could you spell that again? L-O-E-S-S. -S. 
And it's simply a term for wind deposited silt sized particles. And you find lots of it in, in China. For example, the Yellow River is called the Yellow River because of the lust that is eroding into that river. Gives it a very yellow color. But in the Midwest, lots of our soils come from, the parent material is this lust. And it's very mineral rich. And so, not, not necessarily where you are gardening, but across the Midwest, many of our soils are very productive because of this lust parent material. Have you heard of a loam? a loamy soil. This concept of loam is a little bit confused in most gardening books. In many gardening books they talk about adding compost or other organic amendments to make your soil more loamy. From a technical perspective, organic matter doesn't have anything to do with the loamy nature of a soil. Loam simply stands for these parts of the textural triangle, kind of the the bottom center part of the textural triangle where you have a distribution of sand, silt, and clay which gives your soil favorable physical properties. So you're not too extreme. Basically, when you look here, you can see we've chopped off the clay top of the triangle and we've chopped off the two corners. And so these various loams, they are mixtures of sand, silt, and clay that generally you have favorable physical properties. Okay? The concept of a pure loam simply means that you're somewhere right in the middle, where you have about equal contribution of sand, silt, and clay. Equal contribution to the physical properties of the soil. Now, obviously, most people who are gardening are not changing the texture of their soil, and so hopefully you are starting with one of these loam categories. If you are not, th there's still hope, but you will have a, a more challenging task ahead of you to get your soil to have favorable physical properties. If you start with one of these loams, could be the pure loam or what, any, other, any of the other categories, you have a, an easier task ahead of you. Okay, so if you wanted to determine the textural class of your soil, how, how could you do this? Well, you could just send this, the soil send a soil sample off to the University of Missouri soil testing lab and they could analyze it for you. Or if you're feeling, um, feeling like your fingers are ready for a challenge, you could do this textural um, evaluation by feel. It's called texture by feel. And this is what field soil scientists do. They don't send it back to the lab for the most part. They actually grab that moist soil they work it up so that it has maximum plasticity, kind of like you know a modeling clay, and then they observe how that soil responds when they try to make a ribbon out of it. That's what you could see over, if you can, it, it's a little bit dark, but over on the, on the far left, you could see a very long ribbon. If your soils can make a ribbon that long, it means you are in the clay category. And so some of you may, you know, may be thinking, yes, that looks very familiar. If you can make a two-inch ribbon, you're in the clay category. That doesn't mean that your soil only has clay-sized particles, but it means that your soil fits in that large category at the top of the textural triangle. If you look up there, you can see that there's a very large category up there. So there, you actually could have as little as 45% clay and the rest sand and silt and still fit into the clay textural category. Why do you think that is? Why could you have 60, you know, almost 60% other stuff, sand and silt, but still be in that clay textural category? Because this is why I tell my students, a little bit of clay goes a long way, okay? The clay has a lot of surface area and so it has a big influence on how soils behave. So you don't need to have 100% clay particles for a soil to behave very sticky and have these typical clay-like properties. If you have kids, this is probably a great thing to do. Texture by feel is also a great thing for kids to do. And one thing that I didn't mention, you don't need to be a very experienced field soil scientist to do texture by feel. You will you will certainly um, get better if you have more practice, but 
you can go online and if you type in texture by feel and do a search, you can find a key like is shown over here on the far right and it will, it will walk you step by step through each of the things you want to check for and eventually you will identify which of the 12 textural classes your soil belongs in. Okay, so this is a fun thing, particularly if you have kids, it's a fun ex exercise to go through. But this next one is probably even more fun for kids. So, and certainly, being that it's very difficult to disperse soil, you definitely want a kid to do this for you. What I'm saying is, when you put soil into a, into a jar like this, you will not be able to do the textural analysis until you have gotten the soil particles to separate. Okay, so you will need lots of shaking. And, you know, you, you probably won't want to shake for 10 minutes, but if you have a couple kids, they, they might really get into it and enjoy shaking for 10 minutes. Um, soil particles actually are so tightly um, bonded together that to get them to, to fully disperse, it's recommended that you add a chemical dispersant as well. And so what we use actually in a technical soil, soil testing lab is Calgon, Calgon. So just put it, the detergent Calgon. So if you put in a teaspoon of Calgon, fill up a quart jar about halfway full of soil, um, and if you, want to, if you want to get a little bit more quantitative about it, you can go online and just search for the jar method of doing texture analysis, and you can get some guidelines about how to determine the texture. The, I guess the bottom line is the big particles fall out faster. So what you are doing is you're making a suspension of soil and then you are waiting and watching how the particles settle out. So your sand will settle out first, then your silt will settle out, and then some of your clay will settle out. Not all of the clay will actually ever settle out. If you think about you know, what color the Mississippi River is, it's, it's never clear, right? Because there are fine clay particles that are always suspended. If you, if you were to take some of that Mississippi water and you know, just take a bottle of it and let it sit, you could wait a year. It would never clarify because there are particles that are so small that they're about the same size as water molecules. What I tell my students is it's kind of like there's a soccer match going on all the time. The water molecules are bouncing around and they are kicking these little clay particles, and so the finest clay will never ever settle out, okay? So what you will observe after about a day is that the sand, the silt, and the coarse clay has fallen out, and you actually can get fairly quantitative just using a ruler to measure the, the height of the actual layers. Okay, but if you, if you want to be quantitative about this, I recommend that you go online and just look for the jar method of texture analysis and you can do this. And I've given you just a very general overview of how to do it. Um, we, we do something a little bit more quantitative than this when I have my students do labs, do, you know, do a texture analysis lab. But if you want the most quantitative results, you should send a sample into the University of Missouri soil testing lab and they actually will do this as a service. Okay, so let's think about now how these pieces fit together. I tell my students that the sand and the silt are kind of like the bones of the soil. They provide the skeleton. But, you know, what's a skeleton without any muscle, without any sinews, without the things that really give it the flesh? And so, the humus and the clay, they are what fill out the rest of your soil. Basically give that soil its body. The skeleton is the sand and the silt. The humus and the clay give that soil its body. Okay, and so different soils are going to have different amounts of clay and they will have different types of clay. And of course different soils will have different amounts of humus and different qualities of humus as well. But the clay and the humus, they function as the skin basically the surfaces, and they also function as the connective tissues that hold things together. Let's think about this soil skin for a second. Now, I, I like to use lots of metaphors when I'm teaching, and so, you know, a, a technical soil scientist might not use this terminology, but the soil skin, I think, is a powerful concept. The soil skin is where 
almost everything is happening in the soil. It's where the water molecules are being adsorbed. It's where the chemistry, I tell my students that the soil skin is basically the lab bench where all of the chemical reactions are taking place. It's also the home of almost all of the microbes. They live on these surfaces, this soil skin. So when we think about structure, like you know, this enormous structure that we're in right now, you know, in a soil, this would be a pore space. This would be a void or a pore space in the soil structure. And so if we think about the air and the water in soil, the air and the water is in those pore spaces between the soil solids. And the pore spaces come in many different sizes, and they have different functions depending on the <coughs> diameter of the pore space. So the really large pore spaces are absolutely critical for drainage. And so when we have a compacted soil, the main thing that we have lost is those large pores that allow air and water to freely move through the soil. So particularly with finer textured soils, more clayey soils, we need to we need to manage that soil to maximize the amount of larger pore space. Because fine textured soils, clay soils, naturally have lots and lots of very small pore space. Pore space is abundant in clay soils, but most of it is small. And so we need to manage the soil to have more of the larger pore space so that we have better drainage, and we have better growth of our roots through the soil. Because the roots are growing through these larger pores. The roots also, though, are forming these larger pores. The roots are not just following old pores, they also help to open up new pores. So roots are helping us to develop this network of larger pores. Well, how about the water which is plant available? Where do you think the water that is plant available is found? It's not in the largest pores because those pores are emptied by gravity. Gravity drains the water out of those pores. So the water doesn't stick around in those pores very long. And it's not in, the plant available water is not in the smallest pores either because the water in the smallest pores is held so tightly that the plants can't pull it away. So it's the, the intermediate sized pores where the plant available water is. And that's what's being shown up here. The plant available is in the intermediate sized pores. Well, let's think about now, you know, when we are thinking about these pores, most of this is microscopic. Most of this is much smaller than you can see with the naked eye. Let's think about at the scale that you actually can experience the soil. I like to use the term the soil fabric to describe the soil structure because I think it's, it's useful to think about the properties of a fabric. If you think about a fabric, you, any fabric has, has elastic strength. You know, you could push on a fabric and it will give, but it will come back. And soils are the same way. But what happens when you, what happens when you till a soil? You have ripped up that fabric. Now that, you, you know, we will talk about this more in, in a couple minutes. There are many desirable reasons why you might want to till, but in terms of soil compaction, when you have tilled the soil, you may have alleviated compaction temporarily, but you have set up that soil for much greater compaction if you're not very careful. Because when you have ripped up the fabric strength of a soil and then you apply a compressive force, that soil will compact more easily than before it was ever tilled. So we need to be careful about this. Now what we're actually seeing over, what we're seeing on this slide, we have a soil with good tilth and a soil with poor tilth. Who, who's heard this term tilth before? Okay, mo many of you. What, what does tilth mean to you? Somebody. What comes to mind when you think of a soil that has good tilth? It crumbles, good airspace, good physical properties. Yeah, that's the basic concept. A soil that has good tilth has favorable physical properties for air and water movement. It crumbles, it responds with, you know, with minimal effort when you're tilling the soil, it crumbles into a very nice condition for a seed bed. It, it's, a, it's a holistic term. It's a term that many, many farmers use 
very few scientists use because it's hard to quantify what we mean, but it's a useful term because it, it's a collective concept of all of the different aspects of soil that give it physical properties that are desirable for growing plants. I think this is this sequence of slides, this one and the next one, is pretty powerful in terms of thinking about desirable physical properties. What we have here is some soil from Maryland, from a long-term experiment in Maryland, Beltsville, Maryland, where the USDA has its headquarters. This experiment lasted for 25 years. There were a whole bunch of different treatments, but we're going to look at the most extreme treatments here. One of the treatments was 25 years of continuous corn with moldboard plowing and disking every single year. That's what you could see over on the far left. On, on the right, they had bluegrass sod for 20 years. Just mowed it, didn't, re, didn't take anything away, just grew lots of roots and returned the grass slippings. And then for five years, the last five years of the experiment, they grew corn with the exact same system that they were using over on the left. Okay, so for the last five years, everything was the same. But for 20 years, it was sod over on the right. When you look at these, do they look different? They look somewhat different. I mean, the, the soil over on the left, the, the little uh, clumps look a little bit larger, maybe a little cloddier. But the big difference is when we add some water. What happened? Over on the left, where we had lower organic matter, the structure was very weak. Now, it wasn't weak when it was dry. In fact, the soil that has low organic matter has stronger structure when it's dry. It's harder to crumble when it's dry, but it is so much weaker when it is wet. So when we are managing our soils, our goal is to improve the strength of the soil when it is wet and actually weaken the soil when it is dry. You want to have a soil that crumbles more easily when it is dry, but actually has more strength when it is wet. And we could see over on the right, the higher organic matter soil, the water infiltrated, but it, didn't, it did not cause the structure to fall apart. What do you think would happen to the soil on the left after it dries out? Yeah, it will be much denser. It will have a crust at the surface which will make it much more difficult for water and air to infiltrate. It'll make it difficult for a seedling to emerge through that crust. It's going to be much more erodible. If it, the soil on the left, if you, have surf, if you have water flowing on the surface, it's just going to carry particles away. But if you have the condition on the right, it's going to be much more porous. You'll have very little runoff because you'll have mostly infiltration. You know, I think many people have this idea that for, at least for organic matter, that more is always better. And that your goal is just to keep putting on, putting on all the organic inputs you can and just try to maximize organic matter. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. Okay, so let's think about soil organic matter. Soil organic matter for most mineral soils, soils that are dominated by mineral materials, is actually a small fraction of the weight of the soil. Many of our soils in the Midwest range from about 1 to 5 percent organic matter. The soils at the Allison Organic Farm, the research farm that I manage, happen to be some of the most productive soils, um, soils rated as the most productive in the world. And we have 5 to 6 percent organic matter, and it's flat black soil that's, you know, some of the classic soils of, of the Corn Belt. Um, but I'm sure that here in Northern Missouri, we're, we're dealing with very, very different soils than that, okay? So your soils might naturally, you know, at the point when you started gardening, you might have had only one, 1.5 percent organic matter, maybe even less than that. Um, many of the soils in Maryland, where my family has a small farm, un unless you have a, a history of organic improvement of the soil, many of the soils start out with 1 to 2 percent organic matter. I actually do research on organic matter. That's my area of specialization. And so one of the things I try to emphasize is that organic matter is a very complex mixture. It's not all the same stuff. One part of the organic matter is the humus fraction. Who's heard of the term humus? Okay, many of you. 
Humus is the mature organic matter. It's the organic matter that has been highly processed. And we'll talk about that more in just a second. Let's think about the top of the triangle, which may be new terminology. The biologically active fraction of the organic matter, that's the organic matter which is most digestible to soil organisms. That's actually different than the humus. The humus is very valuable stuff, but the humus has been so processed by biological activity that it's not decomposing very much anymore. It's continuing, it's kind of like a slow burn. It's continuing to process slowly. The recent residues, the things that have just recently come into the soil, and of course, even all of the life in the soil, the roots, the bacteria, the fungi, they are part of this biologically active organic matter. They are the processors and they are also the food, okay? So we have the living organisms and we have the recent residues that make up the biologically active part of the organic matter. Humus, I tell my students, is kind of like, kind of like snowflakes. You learn, you know, you learn that every snowflake is unique, right? And that's what I was taught as a little kid. But you don't have any problem recognizing a snowflake. Even though each snowflake might be unique, there's a certain commonality about all snowflakes. And that's the thing about humus. Probably every humus molecule is unique. There's no one formula for humus. But there are certain common properties. After you have this process of lots and lots of chewing up and spitting out and chewing up and spitting out by all the soil organisms, you end up with this stuff that is extremely chemically complex, is resistant to further decomposition, has a very high surface area, that soil skin that we talked about. It tends to have a negative charge. We'll talk about what that means a little bit later. And it tends to have a very dark color. So all of those things, if you have those properties, it's humus, okay? But another way to think about it is you can, no, you can no longer tell what the original source was. It becomes humus when you have had sufficient digestion that you can't tell it, you can't tell that it's a leaf or that it, it was a, you know, an old pumpkin that you threw in the compost pile. Once it has been sufficiently processed that you can no longer tell the source, we can call it humus. Who's heard of this guy, William Albrecht? William Albrecht is a legend in Missouri. William Albrecht was the um, director of the soil testing lab. He may have even been the founder of the soil testing lab in Missouri, I'm not sure, but he was also the um, chair of the soils department at the University of Missouri. He was the president of the Soil Science Society of America. He was a real bigwig. He was a very prominent soil scientist in, in the United States during the the early and middle part of the 20th century. And especially back in the earlier part of the 20th century, when the USDA put out their yearbooks of agriculture, there was really good stuff in those yearbooks of agriculture. Who's, who's ever looked at a yearbook of agriculture? They actually, unfortunately, don't come out anymore. They, they were terminated, I think, in 93, something like that. But for years and years, the very best agricultural scientists were asked to contribute and they put together a compilation and especially back in the earlier, earlier days, th this was really good stuff. So if you go to a library and you find, for example, the 19, well, the 1938 book is called Men and Soils and it's all about the soils of the U.S. It's really good stuff. 1957 was also um, about soil as well. Each year they had a theme and so you get into the 70s and the themes were like better living through chemistry and things like that and the, the quality of the books went downhill. But especially back in the middle part of the 20th century, there were really good books and in 1938, Albrecht had one of the most um, significant articles in that book. It was about soil organic matter and in it he wrote, Organic matter functions mainly as it is decayed and destroyed. Its value lies in its dynamic nature. I should have also put the initial part of this quote, and I'm trying to remember, I don't know if I can get the words right, but he said something like, 
we don't want to hoard organic matter like a miner hoards gold. I think that's the sentence that comes before this. And then he proceeded to say, organic matter functions mainly as it is decayed and destroyed. Its value lies in its dynamic nature. So his point here is that if you just accumulate organic matter, you're not getting most of the benefits. Most of the benefits, not all, but most of the benefits are, of organic matter come from the fact that it is part of a food web. It is food, and the things that are eating it are performing very desirable functions for your soil. So in this day and age, we have a new interest in organic matter building in our soils because of concerns about global warming and elevated CO2 levels. And so there are people who are actually paying money. There's the Chicago Climate Exchange, for example, which will pay farmers to sequester carbon in their soils. Have you ever heard of this before? Okay. The, the goal of the carbon sequestration community is a little bit different than the goal of Dr. Albrecht. The goal of the carbon sequestration community is cast iron carbon. They, they would prefer for that carbon to go into a form where it's no longer biologically active, where it simply is out of the atmosphere, no longer causing, you know, forcing of, you know, thermal forcing of the atmosphere. And, well, that is desirable, but that's not the whole picture. We, we need to sequester carbon, but at the same time continue to have biologically active carbon. Otherwise, we're not feeding the soil food web. What, what are the dominant what would the dominant elements be in organic matter? Carbon is number one, but then it would be oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, and so on and so forth. All of the different elements which are necessary for plant growth are going to be part of the soil organic matter. But the, the carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen actually make up about 95% of the mass of any organic matter. Now, one thing that's useful to think about is which of these elements have gaseous forms, forms that can go, turn into a gas and move away, and which of these elements actually are much less mobile and are likely, if we add them in an organic form, as decomposition occurs, they are likely to accumulate in the soil. What would be an example of an element here that does not have a form that can, like, for example, carbon, has carbon dioxide as a gaseous form. And so when we add carbon, most of the carbon each year is no longer there the next year. It depends on the, the type of material that you add, but even if you add a mature compost, probably at least a third of it, maybe half of it, has decomposed within one year and has gone back up into the atmosphere as CO2. If you talk about a crop residue like corn stalks, we normally think of 75, 80% of the carbon that was in those corn stalks is back in the atmosphere after one year. Okay? What would be an element that does not turn into a gaseous form and so is likely to accumulate in the soil? What's that? Yeah, most of the metals. Potassium is an example. Phosphorus is an example. Most of the metals that are up here are not going to have gaseous forms. Now that doesn't mean that they cannot leave the soil. The number one pathway that these elements leave the soil is actually soil erosion. Okay? And that, you know, that's something that we definitely can control and we need, to, we need to think very carefully about how to control soil erosion. But we also, even if we have no soil erosion, we have other pathways of loss. We can lose these elements through leaching. They can move with the soil water down through the soil profile and they can contaminate the surrounding environment. This is something that we need to think about if we are loading on high levels of organics. The soil only has a certain capacity to hold on to these nutrients that we have been adding in organic form. Now, if a soil has a lot of clay, the reservoir, the capacity to hold on to nutrients is quite high. If the soil is mostly sand, if it's a sandy textured soil, the reservoir is smaller. But I talk to, I talk to lots of organic farmers, lots of organic gardeners, and some of them tell me amazing stories. 
about how for like the last 20 years, for example, they have taken all of the leaves from their entire neighborhood and they have put them on a garden that is 100 by 100. Maybe you fit into that category. I don't know. When your soil is highly degraded to start with, let's say that you know, the topsoil has been removed, there was a construction project, and you're starting with a very degraded soil. Taking all of the leaves from all of your neighbors and adding them to your garden is probably a, a very good thing to do, to build your soil rapidly. But I can assure you that if you never change your strategy, at some point you are putting on vastly more fertility, not just carbon, because the carbon goes back in the atmosphere. You're putting on more phosphorus, more potassium than you will ever benefit from. Your crops do not need all of that nutrition. And at the point that you have overwhelmed the reservoir, your, your soil's capacity to hold on to nutrients, you will simply have environmental dissipation. It will, those nutrients will simply start moving out into the surrounding environment. Okay, you didn't see sodium because Sodium is not considered to be a plant essential element. Now, one thing that's interesting is the elements which are considered animal essential are not exactly the same as the elements that are considered plant essential. Sodium is definitely animal essential. Animals need sodium. Plants need potassium. Potassium and sodium are similar elements and in, in plants, potassium is the electrolyte, the way that sodium is in in, animal, in animals, yeah. But of course, just like we don't want to have excessive levels of sodium in our diet, we don't want to have excessive levels of potassium in the diet of a plant as well. Now, there are a few plants which seem to need sodium. And so if you look at the bottom of this slide, cobalt, vanadium, nickel, silicon, sodium, those are considered elements that, at least today, most people think that those elements are only needed by some plants not by all plants, whereas the other 16 that are listed up there are known to be needed by all plants. All plants must have them to mature and develop properly. Okay, so with regard to salts, I actually just gave, a le the lecture that I gave yesterday to my soil fertility class was about salts, salinity in soil. In the Midwest, we have more precipitation then we have evaporation. In Illinois, on average, we have 40, on average, for the whole state of Illinois, we have 40 inches of precipitation each year, and we have 28 inches of evapotranspiration. That's just simply water moving off of soil surfaces or leaf surfaces. Well, what about that 12 inches? What's the difference between the 40 inches that came down and the 28 inches that went up? Where did that 12 inches go? Yeah, it went down and it flushed out soluble materials in your soil. Some of those things you would like to have flushed out, like excessive sodium. Let's say some road salt gets on your garden. You, you don't want that to accumulate. And so we are, we are blessed in humid regions that if you get too much salt on your soil, it will naturally get flushed out most years. But we also lose other soluble things that we don't really want to lose. Certainly in Illinois, I think the, the estimation right now is that about 20% of the nitrogen that is ending up in the Gulf of Mexico, contributing to the dead zone, is from Illinois agriculture. That, that's undesirable. Now, some of it is also coming from Missouri agriculture and all the way down to the Gulf. But agrochemicals, other, basically anything that is soluble is being moved to some extent, it depends on the texture of the soil. The coarser the texture, the more movement, the finer the texture, the less movement. But that extra 12 inches of water is moving things down through the soil. And of course, it's also the reason why our rivers keep flowing. If we didn't have an excess of water, we wouldn't have rivers that were taking water out of the Midwest region. So we are in a humid region, and that's why we have these rivers that that are taking that extra water out. The nutrients that plants take up are dissolved in soil water. Now, that doesn't mean that they are inorganic. This is something that 
maybe is a little bit overemphasized by traditional soil scientists. Normally, you hear people say only inorganic ions get taken up. That, that's not really true. Anything that is dissolved in the soil water and is sufficiently small can be absorbed by plant roots. Most of the nutrition which is taken up by plants is in the form of inorganic ions, but organ very small organic molecules, like amino acids, for example, get absorbed into plant roots. This is, this is well understood but, but by soil scientists, but not, um, but not very broadly um, expl explained when, when people talk about soil fertility. So you probably observed that I like using metaphors. The term that I use for all the stuff that's dissolved out in the soil water, I use the term the soil soup. That's the mixture of all the different things, inorganic and organic, that are dissolved in the soil water. The soil skin, remember, is those surface areas with the clay and the humus. Um, this is probably a good time to revisit the concept that the soil skin tends to be negatively charged. What, what is the implication of that? Things that are positively charged, yes? Negative is receptive, can take in. Okay, well, it is receptive to things that have the opposite charge. So the things that have the opposite charge are positively charged, and the term we use is cations cations for positively charged things, anions for negatively charged things. This, this may be dragging you way back to a soil, sorry, to a chemistry class that you took a long time ago. But if you ever have heard the term cation exchange capacity, CEC, who, who's heard of CEC? If you send in a sample to a soil testing lab, you will get, thanks Marty. If you send in a sample to a soil testing lab, you will get a number of different parameters measured, and on the soil test report, it will tell you the cation exchange capacity as well as nutrient levels of, of a variety of nutrients. The CEC is a measure of how much negative charge your soil has, and that tells you how much positive charge can be held on those negatively charged surfaces. Many of our important crop nutrients, certainly not all, but many of them are positively charged cations. And so a soil that has a higher CEC, cation exchange capacity, can hold more calcium, magnesium, potassium. Those are the big three of the macronutrients that are positively charged. Macronutrient just means something that is taken up in abundance by plants that are positively charged and held on these negatively charged surfaces. We'll just say that these positively charged things that are being held on the surfaces, they're not being held permanently, but they're being held tightly enough that as the soil water moves through, most of these cations are not being lost. When a plant root wants one of these, the plant root can, through an exchange process, obtain these positively charged cations. So these the calcium, the magnesium, the potassium is very plant available, but it is, for the most part, not being lost to leaching. Okay, so which forms of nutrients are available? Well, the plants are taking up the soluble, but there's also a release into the soluble, you know, a, a transfer into the soluble from these other categories. The exchangeable are the ones that are on the exchange sites on the soil skin. The decomposable, you have nutrients which are held in organic matter. When it decomposes, it gets released. And also we have weatherable. Weatherable means if you add a mineral source, let's say you add limestone, calcium carbonate. Let's say you add rock phosphate. Let's say you add um, green sand as a source of potassium. Not, I would not necessarily recommend that you use green sand because it's a very, very slow release, extremely slow. Basically, you're investing in centuries of potassium release when you put on green sand. But that, that's just an example of a mineral that over time, the chemical activity of the soil will take apart that mineral and release those nutrients into the soluble pool that plants can take up. 
So all of the bottom three are examples of nutrients that are not immediately available, but they can become available over time. Let's think about collecting a soil sample. Lots of different ways to collect soil samples, but the results are no better than how representative your sample is. So if you collect a sample that happens to be right where you had your compost pile, it's not probably going to represent the rest of your garden. Or if it's where you, you know, dumped out some wood ashes, or there are various things that can happen to create a hot spot. You do not want to sample that to get an indication of your garden's fertility. The Missouri Soil Testing Association certifies laboratories. These are the list of Missouri labs, okay? You can see that the um, University of Missouri Soil and Plant Testing Lab is listed there. There are three others that are in Missouri. I think the total list of certified labs is 17, okay? And so those are the other ones. The other 13 are in surrounding states. The, the ones in the surrounding states probably will give you useful information. Because soils are so variable, if you send a sample, let's, let's say you look in Organic Gardening Magazine and you read about a really good lab that makes organic recommendations in California. Don't send your sample to California because their soils are simply different. And the way that they analyze and the way that they interpret will probably be nonsensical for your garden here in Missouri. But a lab that is in Illinois probably will give you meaningful results. A lab that is in Iowa would probably give you meaningful results. A lab anywhere in the world could tell you the total content, let's say, of phosphorus. What you are hoping to get from a routine soil test is the amount of phosphorus that is plant available. It's the amount of phosphorus that is useful to growing plants. And you need to have an analytical method which is appropriate for your soil to get useful information. And because soils are so different from place to place, the methods that were developed in California were appropriate for California, but are much less likely to be useful here in the Midwest. I think we'll just skip through this. this is a, you can look at this for 10 seconds. This is just a list of what the University of Missouri lab will tell you. They have the routine analysis. That's the cheapest analysis. And then also there is the special test that they can do for you. Um, let's just keep moving here. What you get back now, this, this is a soil test report not from the University of Missouri. This happens to be from the North Carolina Department of Agriculture Lab. But what you get back is analytical information and also recommendations, two types of information. The recommendations are based on a method of interpretation that the particular lab has. Hopefully that, hopefully that lab has a method of interpretation that is based on experimentation. There are labs that use methods of interpretation which, you know, sad to say, are, are not really based on experimentation. And, and so I, I have no idea, you know, what, why they continue to use those methods other than that historically, they, you know, someone, some guru back many, many years ago came up with a method in the early days of soil testing when they hadn't done any experimentation they had to come up with a method. And so every lab basically came up with their own method of interpretation. We have made a lot of progress in the last 70 years. We've done a lot of experiments. And our interpretation methods should be based on experiments in that region where we, where we are doing our gardening or farming. If you, want, if you want the most conservative interpretation, you would probably use the interpretation from a land-grant university. If it's a private lab, I guess what I would do is I would just have a good conversation with them. And if they can explain the basis for their interpretation and it makes sense to you, then it's probably okay. If they hem and haw and do not have a good explanation on how they do their interpretation, then probably it's not a good method of interpretation. The basic concept, we, we need to keep moving here. The basic concept, though, with any soil test is simply to try to get you into the sufficiency range. You want to have a level of nutrient which will provide you with your optimal yield. If you have a lower level of nutrient, you will have a lower yield. And for some nutrients, you will actually 
end up with a toxicity condition if you have excessive levels. For the macronutrients, it's very rare to get a toxicity level. For the micronutrients, the sufficiency range is much narrower, and so it's much more possible. For a nutrient like boron, for example, the amount that is optimal is not all that different from the amount which is toxic to some crops. So if you're adding a nutrient like boron, you want to be very careful how much you add. If you're adding a nutrient like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, plants use lots of those nutrients and toxicity is, is very rare. Okay, home soil testing kits are, are not very useful. Um, I mean, it's probably better than nothing, but it's much, you will get much more useful information if you have a sample analyzed in a lab. Okay, visual symptoms. Two real quick ideas here. With visual symptoms, for the macronutrients, things like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, you normally see the deficiency symptoms in the old leaves because the plant needs lots of these nutrients and so the plant will do anything it can. If there's any amount of nitrogen in the plant, it will take it out of the old leaves and put it in the new leaves to try to grow the new leaf. So macronutrients, the deficiency symptoms are in the old leaves. Micronutrients do not get moved around the plant so easily, and so you normally see the deficiency symptoms in the, in the new leaves, okay? Um, we, we don't have time to talk about specific deficiency symptoms. I guess the bottom line, though, for deficiency symptoms is when you are seeing deficiency symptoms, you are at the bottom of the yield curve. You have a you're going to have very poor yield. So most of the time when you have a crop that is being yield limited, you actually have a crop that is simply smaller. It doesn't have any extreme deficiency symptoms. You don't see strange coloration of the leaves. It simply is somewhere intermediate in that yield curve. Only when you have extreme deficiencies and you're only getting like 10% of optimal yield do you start to see these very strange colorations on the leaves. That doesn't mean it's not useful, but it's certainly not the thing to do every year. You, you're trying to prevent symptoms rather than wait for the symptoms to occur. Okay, we'll just quickly go through. In terms of probably the number one thing that unlocks all of the nutrients, that unlocks the biology, Water is more important than any of these nutrients. And you may have experienced, I don't know exactly how dry it was in this part of Missouri, but I know I have students that are from some parts of Missouri and, and their yields were, their corn and soybean yields were very limited this year because of drought. So if you don't have enough water, you will not have nutrient availability. It doesn't matter how many nutrients are in your soil, water is the key that unlocks all of these things. And so I, I would say in terms of managing, particularly vegetable crops, you know, vegetables, most vegetables are 90% water. Particularly vegetable crops, the number one thing is not soil fertility, it's managing your water well. Making sure you don't have excessive water and making sure that you do have adequate water. So you want to have good drainage, but you also want to have water supply during the drier parts of the year. And very, it's very frequent, even, you know, even if the average rainfall for the year was sufficient during certain weeks or a month during the summer, it's very common to have, have drought that is very damaging to vegetable crops. I, I am not a micronutrient pusher, but I think that micronutrients are much more likely to be deficient for horticultural crops, vegetables, flowers, than for agronomic crops. Now, that doesn't mean that they are not valuable. They are essential for all plants. The one, the one caveat I have, the one concern is soil tests are much less reliable in predicting micronutrient deficiency than macronutrient deficiency. A soil test that tells you you have a, phosphorus, a low level of phosphorus you are almost guaranteed that your crops will grow better if you add more phosphorus. Soil tests for micronutrients are simply not very well developed. That, that's my experience. And so you want to look for a combination of indicators to determine whether it really is desirable to add micronutrients. The number one 
thing that I recommend is that you have not just a soil test, but a plant tissue test. You want to know whether it's getting into the, into the plant. I don't know what it costs for the University of Missouri plant soil and plant analysis lab to do the tissue tests, but it's probably somewhat similar to the soil test. And if your concern is micronutrients, I would say rather than pay for the micronutrient soil analysis, I would say do the plant tissue analysis. And if you have low levels of boron, zinc, manganese, or copper, I think you said, um, in the plant tissue, then you know that you have an issue. And then you should start evaluating, may, maybe selectively, so that you can actually see a difference, apply it someplace and not other places, see whether you're getting a benefit. We, we applied, at the Allison Farm, we applied micronutrients. It, for organic certification, you are not allowed to apply micronutrients unless you have a, um, either a soil test or a plant test that indicates a deficiency. With a deficiency, you're allowed. We applied some banded micronutrient fertilizer and we have just gotten the plant tissue results back. There, there was no change in the plant tissue. So, uh, you know, I'm not convinced yet that we, we actually had a deficiency, but I, I'm going to continue to look at that. Thank you. Thank you for the good technology here. And, um, okay, so we're going to try to do this the way I would tackle a typical bed. This is going to be um, overwintered garlic. Who does that at home? All right. <laughs> great. Garlic is this great plant that keeps you busy, you know, uh, late fall and fun, especially on a day like this. It's wonderful. Um, I understand there's Bermuda grass in there, right, Marty? Yeah, there was. We put card cardboard under it with straw on top. I was trying to smother it out. Okay. It's been on about two or three months. All right. Two years would be better, but... <laughs> But it's okay because um, one good technique against Bermuda grass is actually sm smothering it and just covering it and shutting it out as much as possible until finally the plant <coughs> quits uh, wanting to come back up. So that's a good start. Yeah, I can see some dead stuff here. Okay, so we're going to plant garlic. We're going to do on a bed like this for... Uh, four foot wide, how, m how many rows of garlic? Of course, it always, the, the answer to that, or the spacing, you know, the Je John Jevons big on spacing. But the real, uh, the real uh, way to, to answer that question is, how much fertility do you have in there? Because I can see, for instance, that cabbage there, you know, it, it could be fine in some other garden, but just the person that put the cabbage was very hopeful and uh, there's too much in there for the fertility of the place. So we're going to be on the, on the safe side and, and then put three rows in there. Okay, on the high side, you could go all the way to five if you think you really have a real beefy sorrel, lots of fertility ready to go. So three is fine. Of course, equally separated, you know, separated. So we'll go, you know, uh, one, foot, one, one, you know one foot apart, centered. So we'll do this, and um, I'm going to show you how to curve out. This is a good situation. This will be uh, the first bed ever done this way, because as you, in the back here, it's more conventional. It's just flat. But I want to show you how to do the curvature, and, and hopefully some people can experiment this with their own hands, right? Some people want to really get real with this. They can come with the tools. The first thing we're going to do is we're not, we, we, I'm going to show you how not to mess around with it. Just go straight to the point. We're going to put the, just like Rustal did with her seed, was that hysterical? Like, she was like going like this. I just thought, that was great. Just something and with a blunt, uh, you know, blunt sort of end. <coughs> and you don't need to go very deep, maybe one inch. And we're going to drop the garlic in there, in that trench, and just do the Rustal thing, just mess it around. <laughs> so I'm going to do this, and then I'll let you have fun. Um, you can maybe try some strong men or, or females can try uh, to do the same thing with this, maybe. Uh, the, the, the one that will do the, the meal row will have to be a tall person, because you have to bend over and reach the middle. Can, and I'll, I'll show you sort of how it's done. And go like this. 
Okay? I take it back, there's too much, um, the, the, the mulch is too much, so we're going to need to rake it out first, okay? There's too much there in the middle. So, first step, change of strategy, is Okay, okay. Someone does that. We, we have plenty of rakes. Let's let's open up that four-foot uh, bend here. I don't have my gloves, though. I'm gonna get callous. In a in the meantime, I'll, I'll do I'll do the fill-up time thing here. <clears throat> I want I want to I want to have a plug, and this is gonna look like I'm I'm part of this company. Uh, commercial break. I have discovered, I discover very, very few new things that I use in gardening, you know, just a lot of useless gizmos out there that I never, never really uh, uh, use, but who knows about nitrile gloves, gloves, nitrile gloves, those are, this the new generation of gloves. It came out in about four, four or five years, and it, now it's everywhere, Lowe's, has them. It, um, those gloves there, they, they're a certain kind, they have like a real, I don't explain this, uh, it's very tight, it looks, it just feels like a second skin, you can work with water with it, it doesn't get heavy, uh, it's a perfect, uh, perfect uh, tool, and it costs two bucks a pair, and it lasts on me, with my kind of work, uh, three or four months, so look at those, uh, this is saving my hands. I thought it would be useful. Yeah, or another thing, I want a little trick for you gardeners. Uh, sorry, I want to show you how to to do a knot round stakes. Would like to know that? I mean, a real simple one. Look, this has no knot on it. See, but it held perfectly fine. So all you have to do is to tense it on this side and then go around twice, and that's it. And you'll never go away, and you, it's instant release. Just another little trick that you need to, if you do this all day long. Little things. Little things, may, maybe, um, you know. Okay, that looks good, guys. Okay. Now, now, now go, let's, let's have the markers. That's, that's a dock. That's yellow dock. That's Bermuda. Oh, that then lion? Okay. Yeah, right. Thank you. What will happen with Bermuda grass here? We're going to ignore it for now. The garlic will poke, but it will poke. When, when will the garlic will poke through? Let's see. Let's, let's read. Huh? No? In a month from now, you'll have it. You'll have a little, um, you know, a poker, I mean, a little a spike, probably uh, late November, and that's where it'll go, just a little spike, typically. And then it'll rage in in, in March. But the ber when does Bermuda really take takes on? May. May. It's a May thing, right? Late May. So you've got time, and then to so the garlic will move on and will be nice and lush, and then in May will be, you know, the attack of the Bermuda. <laughs> and uh, that's when you need to absolutely be on top of it. And you know, gardening is really that. It's like you need to be on top of it. You can't just stay away from your garden uh, more than a week. I'd say good gardening happens about two hours a week, per week. Less, uh, more than that is better. Less than that is, is, not, is not right. You just lose your garden. Okay, we need like uh, the, the trenchers there, okay? Go one inch deep. Come on, guys. Who wants to do it? Like this. That's all you need to do. Okay? Come on, <laughs> somebody what has to who want to do it. What other tool you got? Okay, we've got, um, Marty, can, can we, oh! <laughs> Marty, Mar where's, <laughs> come on guys, let's find another tool in the truck or something. Rebar, yeah, just try that. And we need the garlic planters. We need the garlic planters. Take your foot out. Oh, do we we need garlic planters behind it. Okay, now, 
garlic gets planted again, it depends, right? Spacing in a row or spacing row per row, it's all a matter of fertility. It's going to be on the safe side. The safe side for garlic, I say <coughs> six inches. That's, that's really generous. So every six inch, five to six inches, put a nice club in there. Just barely enough to get in. You know, the, the garlic will find its way in. Bottom down. Oh yeah, like the famous bottom down thing. Not really fine if you have the time to do it. And Bruce, by the way, we want straight rows too, darn it. No, well, straight. Well, I said <laughs> oh, That's great. On, Just when you put it, press it, press it down. This way we gain a little bit of depth. And do do four to five inches, not six. That's good. That's good. Okay. How many rows are Three. Three. Oh, I'm tired. Next. Well, just remember there's more seeds in a crooked row than are in a straight row. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we need more. Come on, guys. Come on. Get, get into it. We need more on the hammer thing. I hope we have enough garlic. Terry, um, off the list. It's hard for now. Any, any more cloves? <laughs> oh, no. Okay. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> as you can see, four feet is a, is, a, is a bit of a stretch for most people. So think three and a half feet wide or three for, you know, s more smaller types of people. How about you? How about tomatoes? Where you, you need to, you know, yeah, you do one. Well, tomatoes on the four foot, it's just one for the whole width, and then I usually it depends on the fertility, but on a good farm, every two and a half foot. How, how wide do you foot. make your walk area? Yeah. The, the, what I did here is I did a typical for a small garden like this. I did what I do usually is 18 inch, one and a half foot. It's it's enough that you don't like you know have to to become an acrobat, but it's not wasting very much space. Then what do you use for, I mean, for, for, for harvesting and, and carrying things in? You just use a wheelbarrow. Wheelbarrow, wheelbarrow will go in uh, fine. No, uh, carts, forget it. You know, carts won't, won't fit in this system. Okay, we're not going to do this in this situation. If this is not a, a mode pass situation, I'm going to show you how to curve it the, the other way, which is the, the, the way that you raise your bed and create a a low path. Um, in that case, you don't need ever a more. You mulch everything. You mulch the path. Whoa, here comes a big trenching deal there. That's fine. Do you think that one, one way is better than the other to have the mode, mode or, or the sub mode? Uh, for the fertility of the soil, for the production. One better than the other. If you work on a small surface, I would choose the the curved out uh, because um, the saving on the time to mow and because the grass does not steal fertility away from the bed. So on your, on your mowed uh, uh, walkway, how wide are those? Uh, 24. And then my last farm is 36. I went to 36 in the one you saw, but I used to do only 24. But 36 gives me even more space to kind of relax, you know, and 